Welcome back to La Cancha. We follow the most bipolar league in European football, <laughs> where you can have two back-to-back -back games of 0-0, and then the other two games with 10 goals. And, <laughs> and who would have thought it would be Atleti and Hatafi that will set the weekend in light with the best game of the weekend. And this was, it, it was a strange game, wasn't it, Oscar? Yeah, it was, uh, it was the strangest game ever. I had to go and watch it back because I missed the first half. But when I checked half time, I saw six goals had been scored. I lost it. I'm like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Because in this game, it has like more binary numbers than a computer code. So it's in the fact that <laughs> we got seven goals. That, that, that was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. It was uh, Atleti scored twice. They even had the penalty saved. Then Hetafe came back from nowhere, really. And the Atleti got the equalizer late in the half. The second half was much, much more quieter. But that first half was just something else. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's start with the penalties. I, I, I think the first one is, was a clear penalty. The, the, two, the third one was a clear penalty, in my opinion. The second one, I don't agree with. Because I feel it hits Kunia on his thigh first. Yeah. And then he rebounds off his arm. And I, I don't think that's a penalty. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't agree with that one being a penalty. I would have to also disagree with you and say I kind of felt the first one was kind of harsh. Mm. The yeah. first one was a bit harsh. The third one definitely a penalty. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> and in this game, Simeone went back to a classic 4 4 2. Llorente was the right back, Renudo was the left back, and it seemed more like a typical Simeone formation from the years back and seemed to work for Atleti, especially with Correa and Cunha being in the starting lineup. They've been, in the recent weeks, they've been Atleti's best players by far. And it was surprising they didn't start against Barcelona and in games like they haven't really started, but they've been good off the bench and they were good right from get-go in this game, weren't they? Yeah, they were, they really added, they really add, add, they really add life, energy and spark to Atleti and dynamism. And yeah, regarding the 4-4-2, it helped Atleti score goals and look dangerous in attack. But the defensive issues, I don't think any formation change will really solve that, those issues for now. Yeah, but even on the defensive issues, right? I don't think the goals they considered were based on like tactical defensive errors. True, it's, true. It's like two of them were penalties and... One was like one you could do better was ricochet. Maybe one you can blame like Ronaldo for not marking properly, but both goals were like two of the three were penalties in the first half. And even yeah. after Felipe got sent off foolishly, they they held their shape and they seemed to be able to like detract from anything that Taffy were trying to do. Yeah. It was just like how the game last week went. When we went down to 10 men, we defended better. Same thing for Atleti. Hetafe, I think, also just didn't believe they could get the win with against 10 men. Yeah, yeah. And, and in some ways, I kind of question the approach because you would have thought, like, they, had the, they should have taken momentum. They should have taken control of the game. They've been in good form. But it seems like they were more content for like slowing the game down, wasting time, and it ended up biting them in the ass. And eventually, mm -hmm. when Mario Moso scored that crazy bicycle kick, and this is the second home game in a row where Hermoso has come up like really strong, and he's scored the winner in that game in for Atleti. Yeah, Atleti. That was the sixth goal Atleti have scored this season after the 89th minute. So. Just like their manager, these guys never give up. Uh, they never seem to know when they're beaten. Yeah, and, and that's a good spirit to show. It, it's true because like they're quickly becoming one of the most entertaining teams to watch. Because over the last like five games, I believe they average up close to three to four goals per game, which is crazy for for Atleti. And where does this leave Charles Felix? Because they seem to play well without him. All right, he did come in and he did give like the assist for the final goal. But do you think he still has a future in this team? Yeah, for sure. I do think he has a future. But then again, it all depends on him. You know, if he 
if he works hard, I think he can break into this team and make a difference going forward. Going forward, yeah. And the Atleti right now, they're level on points with Barcelona, but Barcelona do have the head side. Not the head side, but they have the goal difference advantage. And they, you thought maybe like they were playing Espanyol, they're in good form. Espanyol have not been in good form, that the Derby would be the perfect opportunity to reinforce what happened last week. But And it seemed to be going that way in the first half when Pedri got the first goal, but Espanyol made it a big battle. And like, would you say Barcelona were lucky to get a point? From Cornea. I won't say we were lucky. I think we created enough chances during the game to maybe win, but we didn't take some of them. The goals we conceded, again, one of them was from a very, very bad defensive lapse, which we have way too many of. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't go so far to say it was a step back. I mean, it's a derby. Derbies feel different. It didn't matter that Espanyol came into this in bad form. So, I don't know, I, I guess when we look at it, it's a point gain since we almost lost it and would have been fifth. So, that's just how I said. Yeah, and on, on Espanyol, like, how good was Sergio Dardo in this game? Like, when, when he wants to be, this guy can look like Zidane. <laughs> he scores <laughs> the first goal. He gave the assist for the second goal. Like, he ran the show for Espanyol. And whenever they were in trouble, like he came up strong in this game. And like describe him, like what do you think his ceiling is? I think he's low key been their best player this season. I know Rob De Thomas has been very important, but anytime I watch that there, I, I just smile a bit because the guy is so good. Like he never loses the ball. He kind of reminds me like much like. It doesn't matter how you press him, you're just you're just not going to get the ball off him. As for his ceiling, I think he can there's a very good player in there. I mean he's played for Leon before. So the, the guy is obviously talented and he could lead the Espanol to some things if they build around him. And back to Barcelona, like who would have thought like Xavi's points would come from Lumping the ball up to Luke De Young. <laughs> and he's been reformed since like Xavi's came into the team. He's been reformed since 2022 came in. And originally he was a joke, but now he's proved to be vital for Barcelona, scoring important goals. Yeah. The thing with Luke De Young, even though I was very frustrated with him in the first half of his season, I always said he's a good player when you use him right. If you now to use him like Lopetegui did, Luke De Jong will score some goals for you. And yeah, he came up clutch yet again. It's, it was, ah, now so relieved when he scored. I can't lie to you. Yeah. But do you think it's on Barca can rely on when they play Napoli next week? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But the fact is that when he started, he scored a few goals. So, I guess he's someone we can depend on in this current moment. moment. And how do you see that tie going for Barcelona? Because Napoli, they're in good form in Serie A. We'll get onto them later, but like they're very close to the top. And that's going to be a real test for Barcelona. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a test of what we could do against a good European side. I don't, I think we're kind of underdogs going into it. So, but not massive underdogs. I do, I'm just interested to see how we do. And do you think the focus should be on the Europa League or just trying to like make sure that top four is certain in La Liga? Because there's still it's still going to be a battle between like Atleti, Barca, and Betis for those two spots. And Rasa that as well. Yeah. I'd rather focus on the league, to be honest. I, I just feel the Europa League is extra, is an extra source of extra injuries for us, and we know how unlucky we have been on that department. Yeah. So if I had the choice, I'd focus on the league. If we lose to Napoli, it won't be the worst thing. Yeah, and maybe that might help Barca in terms of their fights with Atleti and Betis. And on Betis, like they had a good recovery game against Levante. Levante, right now, it's. They seem like a team where if you need three points, they'll give it to you. Betis scored a couple of goals. It was it was too comfortable for them, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it was honestly at at three nil. You just had to look at the Levante players and some of the fans to tell you the whole story. It was like real betis looked like they would score every time they went forward, and they virtually did. Levante were good going forward, actually. But the problem is at the back, they just don't help themselves. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like um, Levante is going to sack Lee Chi anytime soon. Like, it will be their fourth manager if they do sack him. So, and they recently signed Minambras from Salsa as the sporting director. So it seems like the minds of the presidents, the club, is already in the second division, already thinking that they are in second division, their second division team. And that's where their focus is right now. Yeah, it's it's kind of good to prepare for that, prepare for the future so they can come back up immediately because the team with Segunda is the more you stay down there, it doesn't matter how good your team is, you're just eventually just going to get dragged into that wilderness. So it's yeah. good to act now. Yeah, and on Betis, like they were in action in Copa del Rey and both goals they scored in Copa del Rey were out of this world. <laughs> I think the goal by Iglesias, I described it as Ronaldo-esque and like William Cavallo's goal, mamma mia. <laughs> yeah, Real Betis are scoring goals for fun. They are scoring quality goals for fun as well. Fakir's free kick today was a beautiful one. And yeah, like right now they're just ripping some teams apart against Villarreal, like a stronger team. They kind of struggled a bit, so... Maybe they could work on that. And do you think that would affect them when they play against Zenit, St. Petersburg in the Europa League? Because Zenit is not going to be Levante. They're going to be a much stronger opponent. And how do you feel Betis should handle, like, rotation, the policy? Because they're the only Spanish team left in three competitions. And how do you think they can solve that situation where they don't fatigue out at the latter stages of the season? Yeah. I think Pellegrini has already started thinking about rotating some players. So, for example, today, one me didn't play. Um, what's his name? William Jose could start at the week, and Bora Iglesias could start at the weekend. Um, Linus could come in, Guardado could come in. I see Bartra didn't. Sorry, was it Bartra? Sorry. Um, I say I didn't play. And Sorry, so, Victor Ruiz didn't play, so there are people that he could that he can rotate around. But the thing is that it's go it's probably going to catch up to them because there's some players that you they can't really do without, like someone like Fakir, especially now that Canales is injured. They need Fakir's productivity more than ever. So that there'll be that'll be a situation to look at. Yeah, but it seems like even when players are out, like other players are stepping up, like William Cavallo, like really stepped up. He has really stepped up in the absence of Canales and like being that like other creative outlet apart from Fakir. Like we mentioned, his goal he scored in a couple of Ray, he scored a goal today. Like, and he seems to be playing his best football since he's been at Real Betis. Yeah, this whole season, not even recently, this whole season he has been excellent. Like he's showing why Real Betis spent so much for him. And the last challenger potentially for the Champions League spot will be Ralph Sociedad. And they've also, they've, they've struggled a bit in the last month or so, but finally they scored more than a goal at home. <laughs> this time <laughs> they scored out, like they did score a penalty. And is that, is this what the change that, the change in dynamic that they need to maybe be a proper competitor f- to the three that we've already mentioned? Yeah. It was the important thing today was that they played really well, despite the fact that Granada were very solid. I thought Silva had a good game, Yanis had a very good game, Isak was involved, Arafaba was good, Rafinha also caused Granada lots of problems when he came on. So if they can build on this performance, they will definitely try and challenge for a top four spot or definitely seal Europa. Because like the one question, the one concern I have for Ralph is that is they don't score that many goals. They don't have that many shots. Like they do control the ball, they do control the game. But in terms of like creating danger in shots and in goals, like 
they've been lacking in that department for close to 18 months now. Mm -hmm. When you watch them, I think the problem is the final pass, the final ball is just not there sometimes. Like they, sometimes it feels like they're a bit too over elaborate, a bit too intricate. Like they go for the extra pass and then the chance to shoot or score just goes. Yeah. And that, that might affect them a lot when they play against Leipzig because like German teams are extremely efficient in terms of scoring, in terms of creating chances. And how do you see that tie going for them? I think Leipzig are, Leipzig are a stronger side than them and have more depth than them. But if Real Sociedad play to their potential, if Real Sociedad can turn up, I think they could beat Leipzig. Yeah. Because like the other time in Europe where they played a team sort of like Leipzig in Monaco and which was coached by Kovac at that point, mm -hmm. they sort of looked in some parts of the game, they looked like they were out of their depth. They looked like they couldn't handle the way like teams like that played and how efficient they were. So that's that'll be my struggle or my concern for, for them. Mm -hmm. I do think Leipzig might go through over two legs, but... Yeah, I, I feel Real Sociedad right now. They just don't, they haven't convinced me all season. And I hope they can change that. I really do. <laughs> yeah, and, that's pain. Yeah, let's move back to the top of the table with Real Madrid. They played Villarreal, another team. Villarreal is going for European places. Benzema, Mendy were out. And this game was a tale of two halves because in the first half, it was all Villarreal. Like Samu Chikwese, eight. Marcelo's lunch. He almost ate Alaba's lunch as well. <laughs> and the area, they, they could have scored. They should have scored. But in the second half, Real Madrid were the much better side. They created lots of chances. Bill, he had a game to remember. And the area are his fetish opponents. That he loves scoring against them. His first goal in Real Madrid was against them. And how do you see the scoring with Real Madrid? Like, it seems every time Benzema is out or Mendy is out, they really struggle. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Benzema is a wonderful player and you any team will miss him. Especially when the substitutes or the alternative choices to Benzema haven't always been that good. But Bill, credit to Bill, Bill really stepped up on the day. He made runs in behind Villarreal. He he, he was unlucky not to score because really was excellent in goal. But this is a positive performance for Bill and for Ancelotti. Yeah, because like Bill could have gotten a hat trick in this game. He was that good. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, you know what? We're saying that okay, Real Madrid have struggled without Benzema, but they could have gotten the win, the winner here, because um Jovic she had this chance at the end of the game where he hits the bar and Nacho has the chance. And it seems like it that all the the bounce of the ball was in in their favor in this game. True. Sure. Earlier in the season, the bounce of the ball was in their favor a bit too much. And now it's kind of like evening out. I think that's just how that's just how football is. Like sometimes you feel like you score with every shot. Other times you're like, what's happening? Why isn't this going in? Yeah, and they have PSG coming up. They have Mbappe, Messi, Neymar might not play, but like that that that's a frightening like front two. When you think about that Marcelo might be playing and not Mendy, that's very frightening. Yeah, it's it's more frightening if Marcelo is playing. If Marcelo is not playing, and maybe they play Alaba there or Nacho there, it's less frightening. Because yeah. I don't think I don't know PSG. I've watched them more than a few times this season, and they've yet to convince me once that they are a team as against a group of individuals that happen to be good. So I don't really know how this one is going to go. But in the Champions League, I, I feel teams sort of raise their level in a different way. So mm -hmm. I feel because it's the champion, he may play maybe their best game. And I believe the first leg is it's going to be in Paris. So yeah. it might be something where Real Madrid need to really up their game in order to handle PSG's pressure. They can't make the sort of mistakes that they've been making in in recent weeks, because like PSG is not LJ. If they are down by two goals to PSG, they might not come back in that game. And 
I wonder how what's going to go through Real Madrid's minds because there's no away goals. So there's no point in, okay, we're just going to score one goal and just defend for our lives. I feel yeah. they need to go out there and attack and try to get the win. Exactly. That's how that's how teams should approach the away you feel games, to be honest. With the away goal or without the away goal, just go there, put like make the home team like quiet make the home crowd quiet, go there, attack. Especially in this situation where PSG are not really that solid all the time. You need to go there and show that you are as good as them or even better. Yeah, yeah. And if you could give a prediction, where do you see this going? I see, I'm trying not to be biased there, but I see, okay, I see a draw in the first leg. Draw. But I see PSG winning in Madrid because Real Madrid seem to do better away from home than at home sometimes. So I see a draw in Paris win for PSG in Madrid. So you, you think PSG will go through? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know what? In November, out of or in December, when the draw came out, I thought Madrid were going to be favorites, but same. How they've played recent and recently, I don't think they, I don't think they're at the same level they were in December or November, where yeah. they were beating everyone that came in front of them. Yeah. And so, yeah, I do think Paris will go through in this game. And let's move on to Alaves versus Valencia. Alaves, they they finally got a win on the Mandilbar, which was. Crazy. And it came up against Valencia, who they had a strong performance in San Mamez. They were, it was, if those more fouls and more WWE than football actually played in the Bilbao, <laughs> but that's how Border Last teams play. But like, all Christ Alaves, like, this is a solid win. Yeah. Everyone in Alaves shirt really um, gave a 100% today. Mamadou Lum, who has been away from with Afghan had came back and scored and put in a dominant display in the middle. Mendeleba will be very happy with what he saw. Bordelas less so because Valencia just didn't show up today. No, and he made three substitutions by halftime, which was sort of strange. So, but yeah, like it's... Valencia, they haven't really played well in the league in the last five games. But to be fair to Valencia, I feel... The schedule has been very unkind to Valencia, having to play Real Madrid, Atletico, Sevilla, Real Sociedad, and now Alaves away from home, which regardless of how well Alaves is playing, like going there to Mendezorosa is always a tough place to go to. So, okay. yeah, and maybe all that effort in a couple of raids, having a strain on Valencia, which doesn't have the biggest of squads. True. Yeah, th- this particular run, that they've been on hasn't been kind to them at all. I because I was thinking, I'm like, they haven't won since last year, but I'm like, I looked at the schedule, I'm like, oh, it's kind of self explanatory. Like, some of the teams they've played are just better than them, and yeah. there's no shame in losing. Yeah, but they've, they've set themselves up for, to have a successful second part of the season once this run ends and with the cup as well. Yeah, you because know, like the cup is going to be decided in Mestalla, which like a lot of Valencia fans seem to be pretty excited about. And next week will be against Barcelona, who will, will be without Gerard Piquet, <laughs> and who are who seem to have a defensive crisis at the moment. So maybe things might change then. Who knows? Or the same, or the Valencia from this week will show up. <laughs> but I hope the Valencia from this week show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but speaking of teams that haven't gotten up to 2022 in a flyer Rayo Vallecano and my god this was I haven't seen Rayo play as poorly as I saw them play against Osasuna and they were they were poor in this game in the cup I felt they were very competitive but I don't know what's gone on or I do partly understand why it's their form has dropped but this was just like not Rayo at all but like all Christ Osasuna they were great yeah, Osasuna are another team that are much better away from home than at home, and they showed it um, yesterday with an emphatic display. Ruben Garcia scored a great goal, and currently Osasuna are ninth, but they're kind of 
I would say Dan and Ryan are kind of similar in the sense that both of them aren't going to go down barring a complete disaster. But neither of them are going to really change for Europe. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how concentration levels are. But yeah. as soon as concentration level is still good, Ryo, it seems as well as the fixtures getting stuffer, their concentration has dipped a bit. Yeah, because they're also in the Copa del Rey, so maybe that's mm -hmm. attracting most of their focus. But also, mm -hmm. like you've, I've, have you seen and recently in Rio by kind of stadiums like the Ultras, I've been doing some kind of protest, and they were not there this week mm -hmm. because they are they having a big rift with the club president, and mm -hmm. I feel that sort of atmosphere with Rio. It's like although they're doing well in La Liga, they're doing well in the Copa del Rey. So it might give the appearance of like everyone's together, everyone's pushing together, but no, there's like lots of fractions between the ultras, the president, the players, the president, mm -hmm. the manager and the president. So because the managers and the players are on the sides of the ultras who mm -hmm. they seem to be getting heavy handed treatment from the Raya board. And I feel that's also affecting Raya at the moment. Apart from the fact that like, they were also overperforming over in the first half of the season. And eventually they were going to regress to the mean and all these things are coming together. It's like a perfect storm for them, but hopefully they get over it because like whenever they play well, they're, they're really fun to watch. True. Yeah, I, I, I think as the four players, right, in that second half, seeing this goal you're going to score in completely empty isn't really going to help you. No. So, yeah, the sooner that's solved, the sooner things probably start looking bright on the pitch. Yeah. And the final game this weekend was Cadet versus Salta, which the less said about it, the better. <laughs> um, did you know Ledesma made a very good save from penalty, but I think I think that's the highlight of this game. Yeah, Dieter also made a very good save from I think it was Lozano, but yeah, that's yeah. pretty much it. That's pretty much it. And with that, let, let's move over to Serie A, where Napoli, who we spoke about initially, they had a tie with Inter. And Inter, they've been somewhat struggling recently. And they lost to Milan. They're tied to Napoli. They have Liverpool coming up. And should Inter fans be worried about this tie? I don't think they should be worried. They're a good team, but... Remember what I keep telling you about Syria? Like anyone, it's a free for all. Next thing you know, the UV could be within a chance of winning it. <laughs> so, I don't know. Inter, go, going to this Liverpool game, they should just try and do their best. <laughs> Liverpool are better, obviously, but, you know, if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to get anything. Yeah. And the other side of it, the other side of Milan, Milan went top of the table after beating Sampdoria, which which is making things interesting because Milan, they were they were very strong initially. Then they had that defensive crisis where they lost most of the players. But now it seems like they're getting back to where they want to be in Serie A. Yeah. Milan in the last two or three years have been a club on the up after their horrible, horrible down period. And even though they are a game, they played a game more than Inter. The chance to win the Scudetto is well and truly alive now. Yeah, I kind of hope they win it because I prefer the red side. Uh, we're we're on different sides there because I'm like <laughs> more, more of an interesty. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then. Yeah, but it's like Serie A. It's like it's right now. It's possibly the most the hottest title race in Europe. I think it's the only league in the top five that has like. A proper proper title race like the other ones have a percent of a title race yeah. and but Serie A has a proper title race right there yeah. and when speaking yeah. of title races we forgot to talk about Sevilla and La Liga yeah I'll, I'll just have to mention yeah yeah so, so let, let's let's cover them very quickly they beat Elche and um, Papu Gomez he was he was amazing yeah Papu is the one player in Sevilla that give besides Tecatito, that really gives you something different to the control, possession. I mean, Sevilla got the win in the end, but for a large part, it was a struggle to watch them. Yeah. And yeah. did you see the flops that NSG had? Uh, the less said about that, the better. <laughs> 
but but it, it was nice the tribute that they gave to Jaden Rapetegi after Papu Gomez scored because um mm -hmm. his brother in law passed away the, yeah. this past week and it was a touching tribute to what they did. And the gap between them and Real Madrid is now four points, given that Real Madrid dropped points. So like we're seeing that, which is like, do you feel Sevilla can go all the way? It depends on how many more points Real Madrid drop because Real Madrid have started to get sloppy. Sevilla, they, to their credits, they've dropped off, but they haven't lost yet. So I think that's still important. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. It's. it's I, don't, I really can't say Real Madrid are going to win it with any certainty. So we'll have to see in the next few weeks how the fixture list affects both of them. Yeah. Sevilla in the Europa League as well. So. You know, but they have an easier game than most sides. But saying that, Dinamo Zagreb knocked out Spurs last year. So I don't mean to offend any Tottenham fans, but <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to say it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like sorry, Sevilla fans, we we forgot you momentarily. Yeah. Uh, but like, let's move to Germany, and that was the shock of the weekend: Bayern losing to Bochum. I saw the scores and live scores. And I was like, how? 4-1 against two? <laughs> and, like, we're speaking about European teams with, like, shocking defenses. But, like, Bayern Munich, they're, like, they have a really bad defense from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Normally, Neuer is the one who keeps them, like, keeps their defense from conceding more than they should. But Neuer is out for, like, six weeks with an injury and Ulrich, you know, played and... Yeah. yeah, all right. Less said about that, the better. <laughs> and, and but that... you know something? When yeah. I see Bayern, because Bayern have some really funny results in them. Like, they lost 5-0 to Gladbach earlier this season. Yeah. And they were trailing 3-0 to a newly promoted team in the snow one time. I just look at his results and I see how we do against them. I'm like, are we that bad? That we can't <laughs> even get shots on target against them sometimes. <laughs> but like it, it must give Salzburg some encouragement because like they will be a team that's going to be like very high press and like they're they're fun to watch them the way they press and they mm -hmm. might be salivating with what's happening with Bayern at least getting the results in in Austria. Yeah, but I have one thing to say. Where what league do us do Salzburg play in? What's the name of the league? The Austrian I think it's the Bundesliga as well. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, minus joke. Salzburg have a very nice... I like their young forwards in Okafor and um, Adeyemi as well. Yeah. But Bayern yeah, will be too much for them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... If they, if they can beat Bayern, that'll be... Oh, that's something I'd love to see, but I, I think this is too much for them. Too much? Mm. Yeah, but they're a team on the rise. There's no doubt about that. True. Like, finally, did you watch Porto Sporting this weekend, or did you get a chance to get catch the highlights? Watch oh, Porto Sporting. I, I saw the score and everything. I saw what happened after. Yeah, this because was... I knew I knew going into it, Porto won beating since like last year. Yeah. In the league, the last season, and Sporting have had a good enough title defense, but Porto ahead of them. So it was nice to see. Some title, titles have this competitive edge that, you know, the players really showed they wanted to win this thing. Yeah, they, that's a nice way of putting it. They were unhinged at the final. <laughs> yeah. It, it was it was nice, like, because, like, like, you're right. You, you get to, like, this game where it was, like, all or nothing, do or die. Yeah. And also the second goal was brilliant the second goal sporting scored was brilliant like it was one of the most technical goals you would see in european football all season it's like barcelona-esque when barcelona were playing at their peak like if you, anyone has seen it you should go watch it it, it was just a wild game and sporting <laughs> at Manchester city <laughs> yeah again that's another one where i'm like man city will be too much for them much. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong, honestly, because I love to see upsets. But Man City will be too much for a team like them. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I agree as well. And with that, that's an end to this episode of La Caixa. Thank you for listening. And thank you again, Oscar, for coming on the show. And I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Adios. Yeah.